Good afternoon, and welcome to our weekly COVID-19 update for the town of Plymouth. I'm Steve Trifletti, your Plymouth Town Moderator, and we're here each week at noon for this update. Today is December 2nd, 2020, our first December presentation, number 76. This forum is being brought to you live by PAC-TV on Comcast, channels 13 and 15, and Verizon, channels 43 and 47. You can also watch this on pac TV streaming channel by going to pactv.org slash live. For questions during today's forum, please email plymouthinfo at pactv.org. These forums can be replayed at pactv.org slash Plymouth. Today's participants include Kenneth Tavares, he is the chair of the Plymouth Select Board, Matt Muratori, he is a Plymouth State Representative, and joining all of us today we have Dr. Philip Trifletti, uh, Barry, Dr. Barry Potvin, also Dr. Stacy Rogers. We're also joined by Captain Deborah Rogers, uh, Deborah Coolidge. Uh, Heather Cosby is our Plymouth CPA. Uh, Stephen Cole is the Executive Director for the Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. And we begin today's forum uh, with a message from Ken Tavares, the Chair of the Plymouth Select Board. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, Steve, and good afternoon to everyone watching and on the panel today. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I missed you all last week before the Thanksgiving program. I have some uh, information that I'd like to pass on. Last evening at the Select Board meeting, the board voted uh, to cut by 50% the cost of a liquor license renewal. Uh, we are responding to restaurants that are having a difficult time and hope that this gesture will help them somewhat and give them a few extra dollars to use in other areas. We know that they're entering perhaps the toughest part of the season for them, especially since last March. And uh, as a community, we're banding together looking to help them. So they, they do get a 50% reduction, and they have until June 30th of 2021 to pay the current fees that will be due for relicensing. Also, uh, the board supported uh, continuing the empty uh, chairs. Uh, we have uh, received very positive response uh, that this does symbolize those lives that we've lost in this community. And as I'm sure Dr. Pothman will uh, speak to, we're approaching 100 lives. And I, we want to continue to honor those that have uh, died from the, the virus and also the grief that their families are uh, suffering this holiday season. Last night, I have some uh, some good news. Uh, we had a visit from Mike Jones. Mike is a longtime resident of Plymouth, a young resident. He uh, explained to us uh, that he had spent an extended uh, time in the local hospital and observed how difficult it is for people that are in the hospital to communicate with those on the outside. So he came up with an idea that uh, he would like to, to know if uh, people have laptops and they're not using tablets that uh, they could turn in. He will have them completely scrubbed. Uh, there's quite a bit of detail also that's uh, taking place with a local company to prepare these computers to be returned to the hospital so that patients can communicate uh, with their loved ones back home. And this will uh, certainly uh, take some of the isolation away. The, uh, as I said, the, the computers will be scrubbed. There'll be instructions to put with them. And as long as uh, a patient is in the hospital, they would have access to this laptop. There's a great deal of information that, uh, that Mike has put together. I want to make sure I'm going to read these because I want to make sure that uh, people can get in touch with him to see if they'd like to help. Uh, either through donating money or uh, donating the uh, the laptops. The telephone number is 508-591-0074. If you'd like to look at the website, it's videovisit.link. And if you would like to email Mike, it's uh, info at videovisit.link. This sounds like an exciting project. People are starting to participate. I, I've also talked to a few people myself that said, you know what, 
I've got one that's just sitting in the closet. It's time to get rid of it. This is a good way to know that your, uh, your laptop will be cleaned up and will be put to good use. So again, thank you to Mike Jones and the folks that he's been working with. Let's get behind this team and make the holidays a little more cheerful for those that may be in the hospital. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. That's Kenneth Tavares. He is chair of the select board for the town of Plymouth. This time we're going to begin with our medical uh, segment in our presentation. We're going to begin with uh, Dr. Philip Trifletti. He is an attending primary care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess. And uh, Dr. Phil, lots happening in your world. Certainly, uh, we've heard that in uh, the United Kingdom, uh, they've been approving a vaccine uh, to be used. What do you have for us today? Well, Steve, uh, first of all, I noticed you're wearing a Grinch tie. And of course, you know, the Grinch tries to steal Christmas. And unfortunately for us this year, I think, you know, COVID-19 is going to put some pressure on our usual Christmas. But I am optimistic that when next Christmas comes around, the Grinch will be gone. So that's my prediction for next year. Um, but uh, as far as updates, I'm just going to start by talking about what's going on with infections, both worldwide and uh and then work our way down into the state of Massachusetts. And then I am going to spend the bulk of the time talking about the very exciting news about the vaccines. I, you know, I think just like uh, two weeks ago when we had our last broadcast that I attended, you know, the, the numbers are increasing, unfortunately, in terms of infections, and we, we have to continue to do all the right things. But on the, the treatment uh, prevention side, the vaccines are just really looking like they're going to be having a major impact on stopping this pandemic. Very, very exciting news. So first of all, just with the infections, um, you know, looking at what's going on globally, we're still having about a half a million, uh, 500,000 new infections each day. Uh, there's been about 64 million total infections globally and about one and a half million deaths globally. Uh, when we look at what's going on nationally, uh, yesterday in the United States, we had about 178,000 new infections, and we had about 2,554 deaths reported yesterday. So those numbers are high, uh, and they're certainly challenging and um, eclipsing really what we were seeing earlier this year. Uh, hospitalizations, um, you know, uh, continue to climb as well. Um, in Massachusetts, we had reported yesterday approximately a 2,845 cases yesterday. New, those would be new infections. And, um, you know, we're seeing still the average age uh, is still younger age groups. Probably uh, half or so of all infections are in those under age 40. Um, surprisingly, the, the average age of death is still staying at age 81. So you know, I, I still think that, you know, shows, you know, who's at highest risk and, you um, you know, we'll be talking about that in, in regards to vaccines and who's at highest risks. When you look at the hospitalization rate, actually, for the month of November, you can see that in Massachusetts, our, our rate of uh, hospitalization basically doubled, um, you know, from about four to 500 at the beginning of the month of November, and it went up to, uh, you know, over uh, essentially 1,000 right now in the state of Massachusetts. I think you may hear more from other panelists about our possible capacity, but we're still uh, well below the, the high watermark we had last April when we had, you know, about 3,500 or more people hospitalized in the state of Massachusetts. So, so I still think there's plenty of capacity in the hospitals, which is good news here in Massachusetts. And I still wonder, you know, if a lot of that is just because of the demographics of the infection being younger people who are not getting hospitalized as much. So that's... Uh, that's a favorable thing going on right now for us. Um, in my own practice, I've seen uh, quite an uptick in infections. I, I have about 300 patients, and you know, I had uh, four infections in the past few weeks, uh, a couple of older patients, as well as uh, uh, a couple of college students. So, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, there's predictions. It looks like the numbers are still surging. You know, there's no definite plateau yet in terms of these numbers. Um, but it may take us several weeks to realize, you know, if the new infection rate's going to plateau or peak or start to turn down. You know, we don't have any evidence of that yet. So 
Um, and we're going to have to keep monitoring the situation. As you probably know, Dr. Fauci has predicted the surge upon surge, you know, with the Thanksgiving holiday followed by the, the Christmas holidays. And so, you know, I think it's just going to take us back to, you know, all the mitigation strategies that we have to be very careful about following, you know, while we wait for the vaccines to arrive. So in terms of the vaccines, uh, you know, we've talked in uh, past broadcasts about the uh, great news with the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, you know, both having applied for emergency youth authorization here in the United States. AstraZeneca, uh, you know, has gotten uh, some approval in the United Kingdom. Um, and so, you know, we're really seeing great progress with vaccines. And I think, you know, as the weeks and months go by, you're going to get additional vaccines, probably also, you know, getting emergency use authorization, even though uh, that's not being, uh, you know, paid as much attention to right now. But I, I believe you'll see more. Um, important dates on the vaccine next week. The FDA <clears throat> is going to be doing a meeting between um, December 8th and December 10th, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And that's where, you know, we hope to he hear a final decision about the emergency use authorization for the Pfizer vaccine here in the United States. Uh, you know, I give a lot of credit to officials like the FDA chief, uh, Stephen Hahn, you know, I know he was recently summoned to the White House and, you know, uh, there were news reports that he was being pressured to try to expedite um, the process of approval. But the, the FDA, basically the scientists there, they, they have been given thousands of documents from the Pfizer company and they have to review all those documents to be really certain that the vaccine is going to be safe and effective as we've been hearing in the, in the media. But the scientists have to review all this data in so, you know, this FDA chief wants to make sure we're not taking any shortcuts. And I think we have to make sure that people in the public understand that, that there are no shortcuts being taken on the safety or the effectiveness of this vaccine. And, um, you know, and, and our health leaders are making sure that happens despite, you know, the presence of some political pressure. So, but I think the process is still moving along very well for us. Um, in the news yesterday, you may have heard there's a an advisory committee for immunization practices that actually held a vote. Um, and this was looking at, for the CDC, putting together the guidelines on who should get the vaccine first. And so you may have heard, you know, they are pushing the vaccine. The first category, sort of the 1A category, is going to be healthcare workers uh, who are uh, working with COVID patients. And then the, the next category will be, uh, you know, people living in long term care institutions. And so you know, I was very pleased to see, you know, the focus on these two two first groups. I think that was an excellent choice. You know, next week, once the FDA approves the emergency use of the Pfizer vaccine, which is anticipated, you know, then the this uh, advisory committee will also put a stamp of approval on the guidelines for the CDC, and then the states, you know, will be able to put together um, their programs. They the states will be submitting their final. Uh, you know, uh, protocols for how they're going to handle the vaccine this Friday. So, you know, there's lots going on at the federal level. There's lots going on at the state level. Um, and uh, it's all looking like great, great progress. Um, interestingly enough, um, you know, I was surprised to see, uh, you know, when lo looking at giving vaccines to healthcare workers, that it's been about 243,000 Health care workers in the United States have been affected by COVID. Um, I, I didn't see any breakdown on how many of these occurred while at work versus in the community, but you know, it gives you some sense. Out of and that's 21 million healthcare workers in the United States, um, and there's been 858 deaths reported to C CDC for healthcare workers. So that's uh, what's been going on with that risk group. Um, when it comes to long-term care facilities, there's about three million residents uh, nationally in long-term care facilities. And um, about 40% of all the deaths in the United States uh, have been uh, people living in long-term care facilities. Uh, that's a, a little bit lower than in the state of Massachusetts, about two thirds of all the deaths in Massachusetts have been in long-term care facilities. So we've been hit a little harder in that segment of our population compared to nationally. But you, know, you can see nationally, it's, um, it's a big part of uh, where the deaths are coming from. Only 6% of the infections 
come from long-term care facilities, but but 40% of the deaths, so a very high risk. So again, I think that's a good place for us to be uh, using the, the early vaccines. You know, it's very exciting because, you know, it, it appears that in the next couple of weeks, uh, the end of December, we'll have these vaccines available to start to give to the healthcare workers and to the long-term care facilities. And we need, nationally, we need about 24 you know, million um, uh, vac vaccines for people. And the, the dosing we'll have will be probably enough for about 20 million people uh, at the, uh, the end of December. So, you know, we, we actually will be able to cover two of the highest risk groups, uh, you know, pretty much completely in these first several weeks. It's very, very exciting. Um, you know, what we're hearing um, in Massachusetts so far in the media, you know, Governor Baker and others are saying it may take several months, two or three months to, you know, address these first high-risk groups, you know, groups 1A, 1B. Um, and then, of course, we expect to get more supply each month. You know, more and more supply will be coming from Pfizer, will be coming from Moderna. And, you know, we, we should be able to reach down into the other risk groups. Um, and, you know, Dr. Fauci and others, I think, have been optimistic that perhaps by September, you know, we'll have adequate uh, supply and inventory really to reach everybody. So, um, it's really coming along and looking great, uh, you know, very, very favorable. Um, you know, some of the, the, the plans that have been uh, mentioned for Massachusetts for how it's going to be distributed, it does look like they'll be giving vaccine supply to uh, coming from the state, going to hospital systems, and they'll have the hospital systems, you know, give these out to the healthcare workers. Um, the long-term care facilities, it appears, are going to uh, receive vaccine through pharmacies, uh, CVS and Walgreens, and then eventually they are stating that CVS and Walgreens will be able to also offer vaccines uh, in their retail outlets to uh, the lower risk groups as the, we get more and more vaccine capability. Some people ask me, will I have vaccine in my office? It's still unclear, but there is a, a Massachusetts state database and they uh, are preparing us I think also to be able to receive inventory, uh, but you know I expect us to get it later in the process. Um, one of the encouraging things I may have mentioned before, one of the broadcasts, but I will mention again. You know, I saw a survey about people's receptivity to taking the COVID-19 vaccine, and of course, there's a lot of concern. If you look at the national figures, you know, it might be you know 40, 50, 60 percent of people will accept the vaccine, but if you look at it by state, you know, Massachusetts, the survey showed that our state was among the top three states in terms of receptivity. About 67% of residents of Massachusetts are willing to take the vaccine. So I think that's very favorable, again, for our, you know, our state and how we're battling the pandemic. So I, I think we'll see very high rates of vaccine acceptance here in Massachusetts. I think that's it's very important. Um, you know, one of my patients I actually was talking to um, yesterday, and he is a, a former CEO of a large scientific institution here in Massachusetts. And, you know, despite his background in science, he still seemed a little bit reluctant, you know, to want to get that vaccine. He, he wanted to wait probably a few weeks or a few months to see other people. Um, so he, I think you're going to see a lot of people have different reasons for hesitancy. But, uh, you know, I, I try to reassure people I'll be first in line when my, my name is called. You know, I think the vaccine is going to be extremely safe, extremely effective. I see no reason, you know, to wait uh, and see how, how things go. And, you know, the effectiveness numbers, you know, uh, bears repeating. I mean, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine both look like they'll be 95% effective. I mean, that's unbelievable number, you know, far exceeded expectations. Uh, one patient asked me, uh, how long will it take for the vaccine to be effective to prevent uh, you from getting infected from COVID-19? And the answer I heard uh, today, actually, uh, they're, they're saying that about seven days after you've received your second shot for the Pfizer vaccine, which is a 28-day interval between the first and second shot, seven days after, you'll have full protection. So that the protection is going to come very quickly after you've completed your two shot. Um, you know, the Moderna vaccine is also going to be 95% effective. There's some concerns about the AstraZeneca trial, how it was run. 
they had some problems with uh, the dosing, but it still looks like that vaccine will be 70 to 90 percent effective, although you know, we may not see that uh, here in the United States, but it'll be used in the UK and other places in the world. You know, as far as side effects, you know, the, the rates of side effects appear to be very low, um, you know, three, four percent, things like mild things like fatigue. Um, you know, one of the reasons um, the way these studies were designed and the authorization process, we know from vaccine development that usually the more serious complications from vaccines develop in the first three months or so after the vaccine is given. So the FDA was requiring the companies to follow at least 50% of the people who receive the vaccine for a minimum of two months to check for any complications. And I think you know, when people applied for the emergency use authorization, both you know, Pfizer and Moderna, they had to show that over that two month period with 50% of you know, thousands and thousands of patients that just, you know, we're showing there's just not any serious complications that are coming up. So, you know, I think we have to, you know, hammer away, uh, you know, publicly just saying, you know, this is extremely, extremely effective vaccine. It's extremely safe. Uh, and, you know, you really should take it when it becomes available. So um, that's what I have to start. Uh, thanks again for inviting me to the broadcast and I'll be happy to answer any questions later in the broadcast. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, and that's Dr. Philip Trifletti. He's an attending primary care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess. He's here to answer your questions. Plymouth Info at PACTV.org. And now for the other part of our health segment, we welcome back Dr. Barry Potfin. He is chair of the Plymouth Board of Health. Uh, Barry, a lot's going on, and I noticed at the fitness club where I'm a member, they continue uh, to have new improvements uh, such as signage as to distancing and where to go. I assume some of this comes right from the top from the Board of Health. What do you have for us? Uh, well, you know, a lot of that is coming from the Department of Public Health here in Plymouth rather than the Board. Um, but um, we'll get into that a little bit too. Obviously, I can't get through all this again uh, very quickly. I'll limit myself to about 10 minutes so everyone has time to speak who's on the uh, is on the panel today. Um, I do want to express thanks to the select board for extending the empty chair display. Uh, my wife and I were down in Plymouth over the weekend for Shop Small Saturday, and I did notice that some people had actually put um, floral bouquets on some of the chairs. I assume they must have been coming from family members of those who had passed away. So it's really still quite striking, um, and we're very pleased that it's being given such attention by the people in the town. Um, in terms of things to get through today, uh, I should mention about the holidays again. Uh, that's Thanksgiving and Christmas. The governor uh, yesterday said that in response to a question that Christmas is not quite like Thanksgiving because it's not generally such a big travel holiday. Um, and so they're not quite as concerned about the traveling but there is a recommendation that large gatherings for Christmas parties um, probably are unwise. Um, so is having children sitting in person on Santa's lap, um, probably unwise. And also, of course, parades, which often happen, um, usually are not a wise idea because of the crowds that gather there. For Thanksgiving, we're all struck by the long lines of cars that were lined up trying to get testing. A lot of those people wanted to get tested so they could avoid quarantine. Um, it happened before Thanksgiving, several days before. It also happened immediately after people returned from Thanksgiving. Um, I didn't notice it, but my wife noticed that out on Sandwich Road on Monday afternoon, the traffic had been stopped dead um, because there were so many cars lined up trying to get into the local hospital for PCR testing that you simply could not get through. Um, so there was a massive number of people that were trying to get tested. Again, it's probably to try to avoid um, travel-related quarantines um, and also, you know, people that were in large gatherings, uh, especially with people that were not part of their immediate household, were probably also trying to get tested too. Um, so that's still an ongoing problem. Um, we don't know what the impact is going to be on that for our caseload and for our deaths. Um, everyone's predicting that it's probably going to go up, although it may take another week to see the full effect of it. So we're, we're kind of wary. 
uh, you should remember when you get these tests done that they are accurate only for the day of testing. Um, and it does take on average a couple of days to get the test results back. If you go to a, a pharmacy for this kind of testing, they send it out to something like Quest. It can take much, much longer. Also, symptoms from this disease seem to appear around three to seven days after exposure. So if you count forward from Thanksgiving, um, you would know that if people are really getting tested on Monday, it was at the very beginning of that particular period when symptoms might start to appear. Symptoms can also appear up to 14 days after someone is exposed. Um, so that's a timing sort of issue. Um, and you have to keep that in mind when you're getting these kind of tests done. In terms of the data that's uh, ongoing, I've got some slightly updated data from what Dr. Phil gave. I mean, in the United States, as of yesterday evening, there were 13,447,627 cases of this disease and 152,000 approximately were new cases that day. There's been 267,302 deaths and about 1,251 were new cases. In Massachusetts, as, as Dr. Phil mentioned, um, we had 2,845 new cases on Tuesday. That's a total to date in during the pandemic of 20, 221,174 cases. Um, there were 30 new deaths on Tuesday in the state. And that adds up to about 10,542 deaths in this country. Um, over the last seven days in Massachusetts, uh, in terms of rates, there's been 3,307 uh, cases diagnosed for 100,000 populations. So the seven day average of positive tests in Massachusetts is now 4.6 uh, per 100,000, uh, or just positive tests for all tests given. And if you take away the college's testing, which is repeated testing for each college student, it gets up to be about 6.31. The lowest this has ever been is 0 0.8. Um, so it's gone up a lot in the last couple of months. The schools in Plymouth, I'm still delighted that everything is going so well for our school systems. Um, it's a very low infection rate um, in terms of the numbers you just heard is probably about a 0 0.3 in our school system. And there's still been no in-school transmission um, that anyone is aware of. Um, so it's really looking good for them. Um, in terms of town of Plymouth, we had eight new cases yesterday, um, and that's 1,195 total cases to date in the town of Plymouth. Uh, 97 deaths now. It's gone up again by one since a couple of days ago, um, and that's a total to date here in Plymouth. So there should be 97 empty chairs out in Plymouth, and I hope we don't have to add any more. Um, certainly, you can't tell for sure. Um, in terms of what other places are doing, if you look worldwide, you see that it's been really tough going in Europe um, and they've enacted some pretty strong restrictions. Uh, they've done some temporary partial uh, lockdowns and by doing so, they managed to get the rate of increase of new cases down by about 30%. In some cases, they flattened the curve completely. So it's a tough business when you have to do that. It hurts the economy, we all know that. Um, but if you get desperate and you have to slow it down or try to stop it somehow, that's one way that does seem to work. Um, in here in the United States, Rhode Island is having a tough go of it. Um, they put a two week pause in place from November 30th to December 14th. Um, and what that means is that the hospitals there are actually at capacity and they've had to open some satellite facilities in Rhode Island. They've closed bowling alleys, theaters, uh, casinos, gyms, uh, indoor sports facilities, bars, bar areas and restaurants. Um, they've restricted restaurants to 33% of their indoor capacity and they restricted people dining at the same table in restaurants to just those who were in the same household. So some pretty tough things going on down in Rhode Island, but it's apparently a temporary sort of thing. Other places having an issue like Los Angeles, it seems to be a regional sort of restriction. And so the restrictions are very strong in Los Angeles County, not so strong in, in other areas. Um, so 
that's what other people are doing. Um, and they're obviously having a, a tough time with some of it. I wanted to mention some things about contact tracing, which is one of the critical things um, that we need to do very effectively to control this. And you may have noticed that there has been some concern about lack of cooperation when people are being contacted um, and ask questions about their exposures and their contacts. Uh, some of this is probably because of the stigma of being labeled as a positive spreader. And a lot of people don't like that and try to avoid it. And so they may be reluctant to give up the information. They also may be reluctant because they're just trying to avoid isolation and quarantine. Um, hopefully those people, if they're not uh, giving the accurate information to the contact traces when they're on the phone with them, uh, they are giving it to the people they know or they've been in contact with and you know, trying to give them a heads up that they might want to get tested as well. We certainly need more testing. Um, I want to thank Matt and um, certainly um, Susan Moran, um, especially, and our other representatives for fighting to try to get us another stop the spread testing site here in Plymouth. Um, it's not totally precluded, but it sounds like it's going to be tough to convince them to do it. When they're interrogated about it, they say, well, you know, the local communities can use CARES Act money and put up their own testing sites. Well, that's fine, except the CARES Act money ends the end of the month, unless they change it. Uh, they're also keep reminding us that if we do have an outbreak um, and we want to do it, we can get a mobile testing facility sent down to Plymouth if we have to. So still hoping it happens. I uh, don't know if it's going to or not. Still hoping that we don't have to have any further restrictions that's going to damage our economy and put the businesses at more risk. I did want to mention um, that there's a possible new financial support stimulus uh, movement going on in the federal government. Uh, there's a bi bipartisan committee, uh, both Democrats and Republicans, that are suggesting a stimulus of, I think it was somewhere around $900 billion, uh, which would go to the local communities, uh, the towns and cities, would go to the local businesses, would include $300 extra uh, for extended unemployment benefits, and a few other things. Of course, there's no guarantees that they'll actually be able to come together and get this enacted, but at least there's a bipartisan movement on the part of the federal government to try to do something um, especially as soon as possible, because we all know that this is tough on the economy. Um, I think that's probably all I should do at the moment. That's probably about the 10 minutes. I sort of allotted myself, but I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dr. Barry Potvin. He is Professor Emeritus, Yeshiva University, Department of Biology. At this time, we move to our education segment, and we welcome back Dr. Stacy Rogers. She is Director of Special Education for the Plymouth Public Schools. Uh, welcome back, Stacy. Hi, Steve. Thank you for having me back. Um, today, I just wanted to highlight for the community um, our new one-to-one uh, -one Chromebook initiative. So we're super excited um, that we are going to be able to offer all of our students, grades K through 12, a one-to-one -one Chromebook device for at-home use. Um, this was made available to us through um, a host of state and federal grants. Um, we are, you know, well, we very, very quickly realized um, back in the spring when we had to close that um, technology is really no longer a luxury, um, but really an educational necessity. Um, these devices will be given again to each and every individual Plymouth Public School student. Um, they will be transported back and forth from home and school for home and school use. Um, very similarly to the way students would transport a binder or um, a textbook. Um, they will be used at teacher discretion, again, very similarly to how um, we would use a textbook in the classrooms. Um, we are also very happy to partner with One to One Solutions, which is offering our families a really reasonable insurance option for our students who might be a little bit more clumsy than others. Um, so that would also be an option for our families. Um, we are um, starting this distribution um, hopefully by the end of the week with our grade 11 students at Plymouth North and Plymouth South. Um, there was a lot of debate um, along, along our principals around what um, class to kind of start with. Um, we opted to start with our junior class because they are required to take MCAS starting in January. Um, and in order to do that, they will each need a device um, to download the MCAS um, 
platform onto their device in order to be able to take that test. Um, so again, we're hoping that those will, those will start to be distributed next week. Um, and we are still waiting for about 5,500 Chromebooks to come in. Um, as you can imagine, every a school district in the state and in the country was looking to purchase devices. So um, they're slowly trickling into the district and we're hoping, while well, we were hoping to have it fully deployed by um, the holiday break, we're shooting for the end of January, again, for K through 12. Um, we will have um, a handbook, which has been uploaded to our website. It looks like this. Um, it's under our students, uh, student and family tab for parents that have um, additional questions or information um, that they'd like to just read more about. This will be going home with all of our students um, via paper and digitally. Again, for parents that have questions with regard to the program. Um, this is strictly an optional program. So if students have their own device that they wanna continue to use, they're more than welcome to do that. Um, again, it's completely optional for students that either don't have a device or would like to opt into the school, to the school program. And that's all I have from the school at this point. Thank you, Dr. Stacy Rogers, Director of Special Education, Plymouth Public Schools. She and the other members of our panel are here to answer your questions. Send them to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. And today we welcome a new guest uh, to our program, uh, very appropriate for uh, December and the holiday season. Uh, from the Salvation Army here in Plymouth, we welcome Captain Deborah Coolidge. Uh, welcome, Captain Coolidge. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege of serving on this, um, being on the on the panel. And um, I've been asked to share a little bit about what is happening at the Salvation Army. So we have just come off of our Thanksgiving assistance program where we assisted over 140 families with um, turkeys, gift cards, um, and, and the trimmings for a meal. So excited about that. Um, getting ready for our Christmas distribution, which happens Thursday, December 17th from 10 to 2, um, where we'll be um, giving um, food as well as toys to children 0 to 12. Um, our building is open, but the doors are closed. Due to, pan uh, due to COVID. So um, our pantry is running uh, a little differently. So Wednesdays and Fridays are our pantry days. And we're asking people to call ahead for an appointment so we can have your food ready and put it out for you um, so that you can take it. So the number here is 508-746-1559. So please call ahead and we will be delighted to get you some food. Um, if you've been shopping, you'll see our red kettle um, bell ringers are out there. Um, all of them are supposed to be masked at all times, wearing rubber gloves. We are disinfecting our kettles periodically just to keep safe. We're keeping a distance away from retailers' doors as well as our bell ringer is keeping a distance away from the kettle. So it's a little different um, because we are li living in different days. And the holidays are a very wonderful, mystical, magical time for many, but it's also a very desperate time for some. Um, you're aware that um, suicide rates climb at the holidays. So there are people who have a problem going through the typical holidays and then add um, add COVID on top of it. So we are seeing people who are suffering with depression and feeling very hopeless. And so as a clergy, as a pastor, um, we are uh, certainly, we, we try to identify those people. Uh, people can ask for pastoral counseling. Uh, we're trying to give people a call just to check in. Those who are, are regular um, people that come to the pantry or whatever, because we are living in different days. But um, as I've, I've learned a lot um, just being on this panel today, um, and we are praying and hoping for, uh, for better days and, and believing that, um, that we will get through this. Together we will get through this and we will be stronger for it. So thanks again for the invite. Thank you, and that's Captain Deborah Coolidge. She is from the Salvation <laughs> Army here based in Plymouth. Uh, she'll be here and continuing to 
be available to answer your questions. Send them to Plymouth Info at PACTV.org. We now move to Heather Cosby. She is a CPA uh, from the town of Plymouth. Welcome back, Heather. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, it's good to be back. And up until yesterday, I wasn't even exactly sure what I was going to talk about. But um, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the Congress. So federal lawmakers have finally started moving again. Um, I want to update everybody on what's going on with any stimulus packages um, coming out. So the federal government stopped working on a new stimulus package in October. Uh, prior to the election. Where it left off at was the White House proposed a package that was $1.8 trillion of relief that was uh, for the economy. What happened yesterday is finally the Congress has put forward a bipartisan um, attempt to, to reconcile these differences and look at the major impacts that are going to happen to the economy at the end of this month. So I wanted to give just a quick recap of you know, with everything so wonderful going on with the vaccine and, and things looking forward, and even though we're in this surge, it's, it's so hopeful to get there. Um, what's going on in the background is on the economic terms, economists are saying if there's not a law passed really soon, there's going to be a major economic downturn. And some of the provisions that are expiring the end of December include the federal unemployment benefit of $300 a week. That's due to expire 1231. The uh, protections against uh, people being evicted from their homes, that ends at the end of this month as well. So this package is a real strong attempt to bring down, A, the cost, because it's $908 billion. So it's half the cost of the last package that was put forth, and it focuses on the major areas to hold the economy in place until the vaccine is able to roll out and be effective. So... Um, the other piece of this is that the government's actually facing a shutdown uh, around December 11th without Congress doing any bills to pass for spending. So there's a lot that's going to be happening in the next week or two um, federally that will hopefully maintain the economy and the stability of the economy because without it, it could actually turn into something really horrible for we have winter. Think of everything going on. Winter, businesses slowing down on top of the COVID surge. So I wanted to just kind of bring everybody back to a little bit of a financial reality of what's going on. So the, the major points of this new package that are, are hopefully going to pass and hopefully by the end of the year include that there will be no additional stimulus payment. So that was the $1,200 per person. This package does not include that. That is off the table for right now. But what it does include is an extension of the federal unemployment benefits, which is that $300 per week. And the, the extension would be for approximately four months. The intent is to get through winter and to get the vaccine being um, developed, and, I mean, I'm sorry, being distributed, manufactured and distributed in a manner so that the everyday person can maintain their life until this is made more available to them. So the unemployment's a huge piece of it. The other piece of this is having more PPP funds for businesses because all the funds that were provided for businesses have, have run out. There's an issue with the deductibility of expenses that is also being worked on by Congress, and CPAs across the nation are um, sending letters to their congressmen to deal with that issue. But um, what's unclear is if the new PPP funds will be available to only new recipients or if other recipients will be able to do a second round of funding. That I don't have the answer for yet because it's obviously still under discussion. And the other major piece is that it extends the eviction, eviction pro, um, protection so that, that you can't be evicted if you've not been able to pay your rent during, the, during the, this crisis. So those are, you know, it's a lot that's going to happen in order to prop up this economy to get through this whole vaccine distribution um, and so that people can get back to work. There's a lot of, um, you know, even in Plymouth, you think of all our wonderful local businesses and be going out and supporting them. Because Plymouth is slow in the winter anyway. So you add the fact that a lot of the businesses or a lot of people that, that are in our community are then going to lose any funding and protections that they have on a day to day basis. You know, it, January through March could have been, can be really dismal. So that the update is that it is good that they're working on it because they haven't worked on it for two months, the federal uh, Congress. 
So I hope that they'll come to an agreement to get the bare minimums done on a part bipartisan basis. The, the talk is to do a law for that and then come late January after they have more information about vaccine distribution, seeing how that affects the economy, um, that they would then do another small uh, law or, or some kind of stimulus package uh, based on the needs at that time. So I don't have my counterpart here, Michael Jackman from uh, Senator Keating's office to add any information, but that's really the, the from an accounting point of view, I mean, we're coming to year end, you know, I, next time I'm here, I can talk about some of those issues for year end and, and looking at your taxes. But the big, the big issue is making sure that this federal law gets passed to help the economy keep band-aiding it, so to speak, until we get through this vaccine. Um, so thanks again for having me. It's always wonderful, all the information that is, is, is exchanged here. Thank you, Heather Cosby, Plymouth CPA. We're now joined in our economic segment by Stephen Cole. He's the executive director for Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. And Steve, Heather kind of led to you talking about the economy and the effect on the economy, the benefits. What do you have for us today? Oh, I'm so grateful for Heather for lots of reasons, but but also I don't need to be the bearer of much bad news today because Heather, Heather did that for us and I so appreciate that. Um, I just wanna share some broad brush issues. I'm gonna dive right into 60 seconds of Steven so folks can understand what's happening out there. And then of course I'll pause for any questions later in the segment. Uh, last time I was here, I reported that the unemployment rate in the town of Plymouth, not the county, but the town of Plymouth itself was at 6.6%. The trend had been positive for the last 24 weeks and uh, we're looking at a, a continuance of that trend. We're now at 6.2%. This is as of 1114. As you know, unemployment rates, they come in a, a couple of weeks uh, after, after the fact. So um, um, although we are far, far down from our high, which was 18.5% from April, May, and June, um, we still have work to do. There's about 2,000 people in our community who are unemployed heading into the holiday season. So uh, typically what I tell folks is that if you really wanna rebound the economy, if you don't think that your job is going to be there for you, uh, think about the type of job you want to have. Think about the type of job you wanna create for your friends and your family. Plymouth has a very forgiving home occupation bylaw, meaning you don't need a permit in order to run a business out of your home for lots of types of businesses, unless you're getting a sign or you're creating some kind of noxious noise or, or, or smells. Uh, so please, I want you to think about what type of a business you want to start, because let's face it, we are looking at a sluggish 2021. Um, just a couple of broad brush bullet notes I want to share with folks also is that uh, GDP grew by a phenomenal 33.1% in the third quarter. Uh, we're now about three and a half percent down from where we were pre-pandemic level. So it's not a full recovery, but we do see some seismic changes in the marketplace too. Business purchases on equipment have surged 66%. And housing, of course, as we all know, the housing market is relatively tight. That's that's at 62% surge. Um, consumer spending on durable goods soared 82.9%, and that's 11.9% higher than what it was pre-pandemic levels. Some of the uh, Cyber Monday numbers that I saw coming in so far show that $10.8 billion were spent uh, uh, that day alone or over the couple of days. That is the highest grossing sales uh, day in, in US history. Uh, the projected spending for uh, the Christmas season is going to be about $755 billion. That's still not necessarily where we're going to need to be in order to see a first, uh, first quarter uh, re return uh, in 21. In fact, they're expecting that it's going to be slightly, uh, slightly low in uh, the first quarter in 21, uh, down about 3% or so. Um, the intensifying pandemic, of course, in much of the country will keep things in check for the most part for the third and fourth quarter, but there are two huge factors that can't be understated here uh, that could absolutely boost the GDP for 21. First, it naturally seems like Congress is taking seriously its responsibility to, to uh, effectuate a stimulus package. Uh, as, as Heather said, uh, some of the forecasts said that this is gonna happen within the next three months. Frankly, it needs to happen in the next two weeks because on December 11th, the federal government runs out of money to operate. So from what I'm hearing also, and I, and I hate to put a damper on, on any of the optimism on the $980 billion bipartisan bill that was proposed, but it seems that the, uh, the Senate majority leader has already put a stop to that one and is promoting his own $500 billion bill itself. We'll see what the end result looks like. Uh, but do know that there is some positivity in the marketplace too, even beyond some of the speculation. In fact, something I found rather telling and uh, optimistic was that Airbnb is moving ahead with its IPO. Airbnb with its initial public offering uh, is, is estimated to be valued at $35 billion. And I think that's demonstrative of the confidence that people have that we'll be traveling again. 
In fact, another item I wanted to share with folks is that um, um, one of the things I mentioned last time I was here is that Americans are sitting on some of the most savings that they've ever had, at least in the last two generations, right? Uh, consumers are still saving an awful lot of money. Uh, right now, um, the uh, the uh, the consumer uh, uh, consumers excuse me consumers have saved 16.8 percent of their disposable income. Now, now, all things being equal, people have not experienced this 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 setback uh, um, equally across the board. So there are still some people, of course, who are who are uh, experiencing some complications. Uh, but I want to make folks at least aware that spending habits are seemingly returning to normal, albeit in-person store sales and restaurants are still down. With that said, I want to make folks at home aware that we've launched a program in the last couple of weeks to put our businesses in a position so that folks can feel confident walking in there to buy things or to frequent. Um, you may have seen this in Old Colony, but we launched what we're calling the COVID Ready Program. This is a volunteer program from small businesses in our community. And frankly, all it's telling folks is that good health is good economics. On the reverse side, you'll see that the businesses participating in this have pledged to do these several things as check marks. And they're all things that we're doing anyway. Uh, masks are required for staff and guests. Hand sanitizer is provided. There are distance markers on the floor showing six feet of separation, limited number of visitors in loud and sighted one time. And that includes also online and touchless options for shopping and ordering, dining and payment. If you see this, I want you to feel comfortable that the business having it on their storefront is doing all the things that they can possibly do to make you feel safe when you enter their space. So if you are a small business owner and you haven't yet received your free COVID ready seal, or if you know a small business who you think would appreciate it, please send me an email or give me a call at the foundation. I'll be very glad to make sure we get one out to them. Thanks for the opportunity, Steve. Thank you, Stephen Cole, Executive Director, Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. We now go to our state message from Plymouth State Representative Matthew Muratori. Uh, Matt, this is update number 76. What do you have for us? Well, not too much, Steve, since uh, Dr. Potvin did the state update as well as the town update. So, but I'll just I'll just fill in a couple of gaps that uh, uh, that he he didn't have. Um, first of all, uh, with regard to the the numbers that are happening, um, I know um, Dr. Trifoletti mentioned about the hospitalizations. We're almost at 1,200. If you put that in comparison to back in April when we were at the height, that was we had almost 4,000 uh, people in the hospital at that point. Uh, so we're well below where we were back in April. And I think it does have to do with what um, what Dr. Trifoletti said it, with the average age. The average age is 39 years old of people that are, are, are getting COVID. So I think that has a lot to, uh, lot to do with it. Uh, as Dr. Potvin said, the total confirmed uh, cases since March, since this all began, is 221,000 which is 3.2% of the entire population in Massachusetts. Uh, and right now there are over 43,000 people who have active COVID cases. Um, the ages uh, in, in a two week period from November 8th to November 21st, uh, those that have positive tests between the ages of zero and 39 were 18,715. Uh, those between the ages of 40 and 59 were 9,436 and the 60 plus year old folks uh, with 5,655. Uh, so again, the average age of those still getting COVID is the age of 39. And the majority of those in, the, in that same two week period came from households. Uh, over 21,000 came from uh, just people from being uh, in, in socially uh, at home with, with friends or, or relatives that they don't see a lot, et cetera. Um, and then the next, the, next, the second level was uh, long-term care facilities at 1,678 and then correction facilities at 624. And then it goes, gets a lot smaller there. So, so the trending is, is, still, is still happening the same. Um, Dr. Uh, Trifoletti is correct. The hospital capacity um, in Massachusetts is still around 50%. Southeast Mass hospitals are at 50% capacity. So there is plenty of capacity there. Uh, those folks that are in the ICU uh, is now at almost 240 in the ICU in Massachusetts uh, with 130 of those actually intubated. Um, since, um, and, and, and sorry, and the number of deaths as, as, uh, as was indicated is over 10,000 and with the average age of uh, 81. Um, and that is a 0.0015% of the population has unfortunately died from uh, Corona uh, virus uh, with 64% of those coming from long-term care facilities. In Plymouth County, there are there have been 14,890 cases uh, with 896 deaths. 
Um, and in Plymouth, I'm not sure if Dr. Potvin mentioned this or not, but in the 14-day uh, period, uh, the positivity rate is 2.95%, and the total amounts of tests that have been done on Plymouth residents is 40,568. So uh, there is a lot of testing being done. There's a lot of tracing being done. Um, the, um, uh, the governor has uh, in, came on yesterday to indicate that um, squashed rumors that they, you know, we're going to be shutting down Massachusetts. I think what people need to, to, to get out of these, these shows that we do every week is, is tracking the numbers. And, and the numbers is how we actually determine what the policy for the, for the economy will be in the state. Um, and again, I try to give the, the factual data with percentages um, and with comparisons to where we were back in uh, back in the spring as well as a guide. And that's what we look at in order to make the, make determinations of of uh, how we proceed uh, with the economy. But there's a lot of good news, as was mentioned, with the uh, uh, with the um, updates on the uh, the vaccine that's going to be coming very shortly. Um, the CDC has come up with uh, different guidelines for quarantining that will take place next week. They're lowering that to uh, seven to 10 days instead of 14 days. Uh, but Massachusetts has not, just, has not made any changes on that yet. So we're still following the same guidelines um, that we currently have. So, so that is the, uh, the quick update from, uh, from the state, Steve. Thank you, uh, Matthew Muratori, Plymouth State Representative. He reminds us that we do this to provide you with trusted information from reliable sources, uh, local leaders, and experts in our community, both in the medical, educational, uh, religious, uh, economic areas. Uh, we're now going to go back to our panel uh, for their final thoughts. We'll begin with Dr. Philip Trifletti. And uh, Dr. Phil, you mentioned the Grinch, and we're reminded that uh, he stuffed all the food up the chimney with glee, and now grinned the Grinch, I will stuff up the tree. And yet we heard today with food, we have the Salvation Army and other people pitching in. We see people uh, pulling together, putting up their trees, decorating. Uh, there's, that, that, there's that dichotomy between the joy of the holidays and also the sadness. But you have some things uh, to be hopeful about in your world. What are your closing thoughts? Well, I always try to get people to look for the silver linings of life. And, but despite uh, the tragedy of this pandemic, I mean, there's, there's many, many wonderful things that I think that have come out during the pandemic. I know personally, I've spent a lot more time uh, with activities with my immediate family, my son, particularly, uh, we enjoyed a lot more golf this summer. Um, but, you know, I think uh, you still can do lots of, you know, great things. You can still enjoy the outdoors. Um, there's a lot of positive things coming, you know, within a matter of weeks, we're gonna have that vaccine available in Massachusetts, very likely. And so uh, that's going to really have a big impact. And in, I do want to just remind people that I think if you look at the science, the vaccines will be safe. They will be effective. You know, I would urge everyone to take the vaccine as soon as it's available to them, not, not delay. Um, and also just to reinforce, you know, what we do know while we're waiting to get all the vaccines out there, you know, some uh, statisticians have um you know, predicted that we could save maybe 100,000 more lives in the United States if we were more adherent, you know, to all the mitigation strategies like wearing masks, you know, avoiding uh, indoor gatherings without masks, you know, trying to maintain our social distances, you know, the hand washing, all those things. So, you know, we have to continue to do those things as much as we can, you know, until the vaccine is, is widespread uh, distributed. So, uh, I just want to say, uh, you know, continue to enjoy the holiday season and celebrate it with your families, immediate families. Thank you very much for having me today, Steve. Dr. Philip Trifletti, attending primary care physician, Beth Israel Deaconess. We're going to go to Dr. Barry Potvin. Uh, and Barry, you and your Board of Health have been very busy this year. We appreciate uh, all that you've done to step up to the plate uh, to help us out. What's the takeaway today from today's presentation? Uh. Well, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention, and then I'll give you the takeaway. Um, first is, as the usual plug, the Board of Health will be meeting next Wednesday at 4 o'clock, and we will have a lot more charts, tables, graphs, um, and more information that will be available then. Uh, we usually meet at 4 o'clock, and it can run up till 6. 
I also wanted to mention, and I think Steve Stephen will be really interested in this. No one has mentioned it. Um, I did see on Channel 5, there was a show called Chronicle that starts at 7.30 p.m. And at one point last week, there was a show, it was all about Plymouth. And there were people in Plymouth that were being, you know, hosting the show. Um, and it was quite impressive. And the first thought I had after I saw that was, boy, that, that'll bring some tourists into Plymouth. And sure enough, when we went downtown on Saturday and talking to some of the store owners, they had seen quite a burst of activity on Saturday. So I was very pleased about that. Um, finally, just to end on a really positive note, um, like everyone else, we're really all looking forward um, to the holidays next year and also the celebration finally of Plymouth 400. Um, I think that it's probably gonna be possible to do that uh, by the time the fall comes next year, and certainly, hopefully, also late summer, we should have this under some semblance of control. And some of these restrictions will probably be starting to loosen and people feel more comfortable about traveling and coming down to Plymouth. Um, this is all probably mostly because of the vaccines, but also because of people abiding by and trying to follow the guidelines, especially wearing masks um, and you know keeping physical distancing and personal hygiene being good. Um, so if you think about what's gonna happen, please be positive about what's likely to happen as soon as we get these vaccines distributed. It probably won't happen until the spring, until the late early summer, uh, but then things will be looking a lot better thereafter. So um, I hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving um, and hopefully next Thanksgiving, we'll be able to have a lot more people to get together with and we'll be having an awful, a lot more things to be thankful for at that point. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dr. Barry Potvin, Professor Emeritus, Yeshiva University. We now go back to Dr. Stacy Rogers. Stacy, that was exciting information about all the Chromebooks for all students uh, in Plymouth Public Schools. Uh, what do you want us to remember today about education in Plymouth? Yeah, just as always, Plymouth Public Schools continues to be a resource to our um, families and our community. So please do not hesitate to reach out to your building principals or um, your central office staff over at Lincoln Street. And if we can help in any way, we're happy to do that. Have a safe and happy holiday season. Thank you, Dr. Stacy Rogers. She is Director, Special Education, Plymouth Public Schools. Captain Deborah Coolidge, my Rotary Club, is uh, involved in participating uh, with your kettles, and uh, we're grateful for all of the good work the Salvation Army does. I always find it particularly comforting to have clergy uh, join us during this pandemic because uh, your words are comforting uh, for those people uh, who experience not only the joy but some of the challenges of the holidays. Uh, what do you want our viewers to remember today? Well, I think... Um I know back in April, I felt literally like God had stopped the world from spinning. Um, and I think um, personally for me and for those um, who I'm in contact with, um, I, my prayer is that we're learning that um, we weren't really created for the busyness that we often live in. Um, and, and I think that we've had to take a an actual pause and learn what's truly important and what truly, truly is important is, is people and it's building relationship with people and just remembering, I know for me, it's, it's helped me to, to really slow down and take time to, to live in the moment and, and not be so caught up in what's going to happen in an hour from now or in a day from now and just really be present in the moment and be present with the people that are in your life. And that's truly what's the most important thing. And so I just want Plymouth residents to know that we here at the Salvation Army, we're praying for you and we're here for you, be it if you have a physical need, an emotional need, a spiritual need, we're here to help you in whatever way we can. So God bless you through this holiday season. Thank you, Captain Coolidge. And we in Plymouth are particularly fortunate and grateful from the Salvation Army uh, for placing uh, Captain Coolidge back in Plymouth since she is a uh, graduate of Plymouth Public Schools and uh, 
grew up in Plymouth. So again, thank you. And now we go to Heather Cosby, Plymouth CPA. Heather, what would you like us as a takeaway today to remember? Sorry, I have to unmute myself again. Um, I just want to say it's always so great to hear from the Salvation Army and to have that resource so strong in our community is fantastic. And, you know, at the end of the day, there is a lot going on, but we have so much to be thankful for. Um, and, you know, just business owners, I mean, I'm here. My, my two sons are in the other room uh, doing their remote learning today. So, you know, it's actually a blessing to spend time with them. But it's very, definitely difficult, and all the business owners in town, they're, they're toting their kids around while they're trying to get things done. You know, just take a breath, take a moment for yourself, and us as residents, go buy gift cards to the restaurant. Go do all your shopping locally that you can. You know, just really try and support these businesses that are trying to get through this winter, and uh, everybody, you know, continue to have a wonderful holiday season the best you can. Thank you, Heather Cosby, the Plymouth CPA. Stephen Cole. Uh, what are your final thoughts? Thank you, sir. Just want to remind folks of that impressing number. 2,000 people in our town are still looking for a job. So if you're hiring or if you are thinking about starting a type of a business, think about the type of job you want to create because we will be coming back. I promise you this. We will be coming back. And I want to make sure that the jobs we have are better than the ones we had and that people are working closer to home so they don't have to do about a 90-minute round trip to, into Boston just to work. Thanks, folks. Stephen Cole, Executive Director, Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. As we finish out our panel, uh, Matt Muratori, uh, Plymouth State Representative, uh, what do you want us to remember? You know, Steve, hearing everyone today, it was a lot about optimism. You know, hearing the Salvation Army, I, I am a Rotarian like you, Steve, and, you know, a couple months ago we heard maybe the, the bell ringing wasn't going to happen because of this pandemic, but thank God that they're going to be doing it. And I'll be out there again this year at Walmart doing it. So uh, we thank the Salvation Army for what they do for the community as well. And so blessed to have uh, Captain Coolidge here. Um, and, and she's right. There's a lot to be thankful for. Um, you know, there's a lot that, you know, we need to pause. And, you know, maybe God was telling us that we had to pause as a, as a society, as a world, um, and just um, recenter ourselves to what's really important in life. Maybe we were going too fast. So um, it is a real blessing. I think it's, it, there is optimism um, with that of what will come out of that. Also, you know, when you, when you look at the, the seven day average of, of positivity rate, you know, people can say, oh my God, it's up to 4.6. Or you can say, oh, it's only 4.6. It's not 25% like it was in April. So it, it's how you choose to look at these things. Um, and I choose to give the facts of, to people uh, and let them choose how they want to look at it. Um, but, but again, it, the cases are rising. We still need to, even though the, there's a vaccine on the way, uh, we still need to still mask up. We still need to social distance. Uh, it's still going to be you know, a good three to six months um, before we all start seeing that vaccine. So we're going to be in this for, for quite a while. So don't let your don't let your guard down. Also, with you, we're so blessed with the with the schools too. Um, it's so underestimated what the schools and those kids are doing. Not having any transmissions with over seven thousand kids in the school system. It's just it's just amazing. And I keep saying this week after week, but we can take lessons from these kids and how they're doing it um, as a society. So we're really we're really blessed with that. Um, seeing the unemployment rate come down that Steve brought up, that's terrific news, Steve. Good to, good to hear that. Um, I'll always say, again, that that's, may not be the trend after the holidays. That may start going up again. So we're going to have people still that are going to be in need. So, again, we can't let our, our guard down, even though there's optimism uh, along the way. Um, and that laptop idea, this is what Plymouth is all about. I'm glad Ken brought this up. I watched the select boards meeting last night. You know, this Plymouth is about coming together as a community and working together as a community. Um, you know, we, we just got through an election, which is, you know, a national election, which is great. You know, there's optimism there. Um, you know, we can all maybe start working together as a society, uh, as a town, as a state, uh, more so than maybe we, we have been the last few years. And again, maybe that was the reason why we had to, we had to pause um, as a society. So, uh, let's take this time to really start working together and really help this whole laptop idea. It, it's not just going to be for a hospital 
the hospital. It could also be for long-term care facilities as well. So if they can have a laptop or an iPad with just Zoom on it with simple instructions, uh, they can be connected to their loved ones. Because again, this is going to be another three, six months easy that we're going to be in this. So um, I guess I'll, I'll uh, the, the, only, the only last thing I'll say, Steve, is one thing I've, I'm starting to notice is there is a, a lot of decorations out this year, holiday decorations. They seem to come out a little bit earlier and they seem to be becoming more plentiful too. Uh, people are doing more and more in their yards, which is really a nice thing to do. So if you haven't done it yet, the weather's still good. I would challenge folks in Plymouth to decorate a little bit more this year than you usually do. It kind of, you know, you drive around, it just kind of brings a little smile to your face. And it's, again, you're, you're not doing as much, so you're maybe noticing some more. So uh, so let, let's, let's do that as well. And speaking of Chronicle, there is a, a program on Chronicle tonight. Uh, a gentleman from Kingston, um, his name is Frank Basler. Um, and he's going to be profiled as somebody living with, living through COVID and had a difficult time with it. So they're going to showcase his, uh, his story. So if anybody's interested in, in a true in COVID story that you know, could have gone real bad but turned out really well, um, for the most part, uh, listen to uh, watch Chronicle tonight at 730. You can see that. So as we end every show, Steve, uh, and I steal this line from Dr. Trifoletti, you know, controlling good COVID is, is, is not only good for the economy, but it's good for our health and it's good for our students as well. So we'll see you next week, Steve. Thank you, uh, Matthew Miratoy, Plymouth State Representative. Thank you to all the members of our panel, Dr. Philip Trifletti, Dr. Barry Potvin, Dr. Stacey Rossers, Rogers, Captain Deborah Coolidge, Heather Cosby, Stephen Cole, and now we go back to Kenneth Tavares. He is the chair of Plymouth Select Board. Ken, what are your final thoughts? Ken is unmuting himself. Actually, I have, uh, that's better. Um, I have uh, several closing thoughts, but I'm going to reduce it uh, to one. I do want to make uh, an announcement. It was mentioned uh, uh, that Plymouth uh, 400 is, uh, is, is still around, and I want people to know that. I have a meeting today at 3 o'clock to discuss uh, plans for 2021. There's so much more that uh, we are planning on doing. We just had to put it off a year. So Plymouth 400 is alive and well. But my takeaway really uh, follows uh, the kind remarks from a number of the speakers, and that is uh, listening to uh, Captain Coolidge. Thank you. Your words are powerful today. They're extremely powerful. Ever since uh, I can remember as a longtime resident of this community, the Salvation Army has been noted for helping and not asking for anything in return. We are so fortunate to have this organization and in, in Plymouth. So thank you, Captain Coolidge, and know that the Plymouth community is behind you because you folks have always served and served with distinction. Thank you. Thank you, and that's Kenneth Tavares. He is chair of the Plymouth Select Board. Next week, we'll be joined by Ken, Matt, Dr. Mark Wilson, also Sarah Cloud, and Susan Givanetti. She is the executive director of uh, Plymouth Area Coalition for the Homeless, Michael Jackman from Congressman Bill Keating, Michelle Braddy, director of Elder Affairs, Amy Naples, executive director, Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, please join us again next Wednesday at noon. I'm Steve Trifletti. Plymouth Town Moderator, and good day.